So continuing on from where we last left off, what I want to do is take a look at my script.js file again, and I want to discover what some of these keywords mean like new and this. Also, I want to take a look at how the prototype is attached, where this prototype object is stored, and also I want to take a look at the console.log information. I want to see that output and find out what this actually is. So first of all, I want to explain the keyword this. And I'll do it in a very simple way by actually explaining the word this. It might sound elementary, but you'll come to see that you must keep this simple. So this is a context based keyword. Depending on what sentence you put this into in the English language, it has a different meaning. So for example, if I say read this, now we have to look at this sentence in context to find out what the word this means, which in context, this is referring to a book. Now this isn't the object itself, it's simply a reference to the object, which is the book. If I was to walk into a car showroom and say buy this, this is now in context talking about a car. If I walk into a sofa store and say buy this, this is now a sofa and so on and so forth. Now in programming, this is exactly the same. This is not an object of itself. It's a reference to an object. When I point to something, I'm referencing an object. Look at this. The same is in programming. If I type the this keyword, you're telling the JavaScript JIT compiler, look at this. That's exactly what you're doing. So what does the new keyword have to do with the this keyword? Well, let's take a look. What I'll do is I'll get rid of the new keyword, but it's gonna produce something that isn't an object. It's gonna produce something very different indeed. We are just gonna call the function directly for the Apple variable. Apple two, we're gonna keep the new, and Apple three, we're gonna keep the new keyword in front of the invocation of the construct Apple function. So we're gonna say invoke it with a new context. Whereas with this, we're gonna invoke it without a new context. Let's find out what this is referring to when it comes to invoking it without the new keyword and invoking it with the new keyword. Let's save that and hit refresh. So what happened is we first invoked the function on Apple and this called the function without defining any context. We didn't define a context. So what happened was JavaScript defaulted to the window object. So the first time it ran this was actually referring to the window object. Now imagine there's somebody standing in front of you. They've got their head down, eyes closed, and their hands by their side. They're not pointing to anything. They're not looking at anything. And they say to you, look at this. You're gonna raise one eyebrow and go, what do you mean, look at this? You're not referencing anything. You're not pointing to anything. You're not looking at anything. You're not even making any reference to the direction I should look. What do you mean, look at this? And that's exactly what the JIT compiler is doing. On the first run, we're not defining any context. So when you invoke a function like this, you're not giving it any context. That's like me, again, looking down at the ground, eyes closed, hands by my side, not referencing, not pointing to anything, and I say to you, look at this. The JIT compiler's gonna go, what do you mean look at this? So what happens is the this keyword defaults to the window object. So it's kind of like saying this equals window. Now this isn't valid. You cannot set the value of the this keyword. You can't do that, but I'm just doing this for illustration purposes. So it's like saying window.color, window.width, window.height. That's the first time this function was invoked. This was equal to window. It's a reference to the window object. And that has unintended consequences. 
I can say window dot color. Don't forget, the first time it ran, it ran with window. So window dot color has the value of red. We've created a global variable. I can just type in color, don't forget. I don't have to type in window. I can just say color. And the JIT compiler will go to the window object and look for the color property. And it'll find it. There it is, red. It'll find a width property and a height property on the window object. Because again, this ran as the window. So this equals window is window.color, window.width, window.height. You've created those properties on the window object. That's on the first run only. So if I go ahead and scroll down, you will notice there's the width property directly on the window object. We also have the height property directly on the object. And we also have in here the color property as well. That was unintentional and that's bad. That's why you have to be very, very careful with your constructor functions. You should always put the new keyword before invoking the constructor function. The reason being is because it gives it a new context. This is very important. So don't forget, if I just invoke the function as is, I'm not defining any context. That's me shutting my eyes, looking down at the floor, not pointing at anything, hands by my side, and I say to you, look at this. And you're going, what? What do you mean, look at this? And so what JavaScript does, it says, well, I don't know what you're trying to get me to look at. So I'm going to default to the window object. We've not actually defined any context for this. So it defaults to window. And that can lead to very unintentional results. So you do have to be careful with your constructor functions and make sure that you say new in front of it. Otherwise, what you're going to do is manipulate the window object. So you don't want this equal to window because you haven't given it any context. Instead, you give it the new keyword. Now think, what is a constructor function going to do? It's going to construct an object. So what will new do? Well, now we're giving some context to this function. We are creating a new page, if you will, a blank page. And we say here, here's this blank page. Now it says, ah, I know what this is. It's a blank page. And so the new keyword is saying, look at this, and it's pointing to an empty object. So this, in context, is an empty object. It's a new object. Now we've given our function context. And it does something very special as well. Because not only does this now equal an empty object, it will automatically say, well, you're creating this new object via the construct apple function. And this construct apple function has a prototype object associated with it. And this is where the link is established. It's a special link. Again, it's not going to import these methods or properties, whatever you've got in your prototype object. Instead, what it's going to do is it's going to establish a link between the object that was created via the construct apple function. So it creates an empty object and it establishes that link immediately like that instant. So now I'm going to go ahead and delete this out. Now we have the new keyword, a new blank empty context. Now we're telling the JIT compiler, here's a blank object, and that defines the context. Now the JIT compiler knows what you're pointing at. It knows what to look at. So if I hit refresh, you will notice that each time it ran, we ran it three times with the new keyword, this immediately returned for each time it was run. So that's it. That's how easy it is to establish a new object as your context. So if this is equal to a new object, then it's just like manipulating an object. So we say this, which is just like targeting any other object that you store in a variable. If I say var hello and hello is an object, and then I say hello, dot prop equals property. 
what I am doing is I'm targeting that object just like we have done before and we're actually creating a property on that object and giving it a value. Well, that's exactly what we're doing here, but this time we are using the this keyword which references an empty object and so we're creating three properties on that empty object and giving it a value. So it's just like saying this color equals red that will target that blank object and give it the color property. Just like so. So that's real easy and nice to understand. So if I say console.log this right here, don't forget JavaScript goes line by line, is compiled line by line. So if I console.log this before manipulating this object, all you're going to get is an empty object. If I say console.log and I do it below the manipulation, so now I've added all those properties to that empty object and now I log that object out to the console, you will notice you will get the object with the three properties, color, width, and height. So it does matter where you call console.log. So these three objects were created via the construct apple function. And you can see here in the console.log that it keeps a note of the constructor function. But does that mean we can't manipulate one of these objects without affecting the other objects that were created by this function? The answer is no. It's just created a standard object with three properties. The special part is the fact that it's attached to prototype. We'll look at that in just a second, but right now we have Apple. So this is the first Apple that was created and it's stored within the Apple variable. And then I'm gonna modify the color of this Apple to be green. So this Apple is now unique, so I can say Call up Apple, and there we go, this Apple is green. Call up Apple 2 and Apple 3, and they're still red apples. So you can manipulate these objects and not affect the other objects that were created by this constructor function. You can do whatever you'd like. You can add properties, add methods to this object specifically to any one of those Apple objects and it won't affect any of the other objects created by the constructor function. You're just creating a blueprint, a template. Now also, as mentioned, the object that is stored in this automatically has a relationship to the prototype object. JavaScript does that automatically for you. So even let's say I take this all out, I take those lines out, and we just have an empty object. So basically Apple and Apple 2 and Apple 3 are all empty. They contain no properties, but all of them have a prototype object and they have eat, nibble, and throw. So I don't even have to add any properties on here or anything like that. That relationship is automatically established. JavaScript says you are creating this new object via this function. And this function has a prototype object associated with it. So I'm automatically going to link them up. So I can even say apple.eat, apple2.eat, apple3.eat, and you'll get the same result every time because it's going straight to that prototype object and saying call that method. So that's how it works. And what's really nice about this is this prototype object is only attached to the Apple objects. Now, the reason why that's important is because last time when I was using the underscore underscore proto underscore underscore property, it affected all objects. If I was to create a new object, just like so, and say test.eat, or nibble, or throw, you'd get an error because this prototype is only attached to our Apple objects, that type of object that was created via our constructor function. So this is very, very cool and very important because we don't want to affect all of the objects. That's why browser vendors make it very difficult for you to access the prototype property, not on a function, but on an object because you can end up affecting every single object you create. That's bad. So this way we're establishing a correct relationship. So let's go ahead and bring back all of the properties and hit refresh. 
Now, can we affect that prototype object that's linked to all of our Apple objects at runtime? AKA, I can affect it right now in the console. The answer is yes. If I take a look at the window object and we can find our constructor function. Let's go ahead and scroll down. There is our construct Apple function on the window object. So it's a globally accessible function and it has a prototype object associated with it. And there it is, eat, nibble and throw. So what I can do is I can target this property on the window object, which I don't have to type window dot. I can just type in the name of the property and JavaScript will automatically search for this property name on the window object. And then I can affect the prototype object. Let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to type in construct apple and then I'm going to say dot prototype. Now I'm affecting that prototype object. If I hit return, you'll notice it went to the window object. It found the key name construct apple and then it pulled out the prototype object. And there it is, eat, nibble and throw. So now I can manipulate it like any other object. So I can say point to that object and let's add a new method or property. I'll just add a new property called shared and say hello apple. So now when I take a look at the window object and we take a look at the construct apple property, there it is. And then you'll notice we have the prototype. Now we have a shared property on here. Now, let's say apple dot, and there it is, shared. So this, well, what it will do is it will first of all, look at the object and say, is there a property called shared or a keyword or key name called shared? No, open it up and go to the prototype. I didn't find it here in the object. Let's go into the prototype object. Ah, there it is, shared. And that's exactly what it returned. And the same goes for Apple II and Apple III. Now, if we take a look at this very quickly, you can see that it generates the same three properties with the same three values. Now, this may not be beneficial. Let's say we want to dynamically create objects. Let's say we have a game and in the game when the user touches an apple, just like Crash Bandicoot, they get points. So we have apples that need to be dynamically generated in different places. Well, in that case, we can't just generate the same template exactly the same. What we want to do is keep the structure. We want to keep those properties, but we want those properties to have different values. How do we do that? The simple answer is to use arguments. So I'm going to create three arguments, color, width, and height. Remember, these three arguments are temporary boxes. They are like variables, but they're temporary because after the function has finished executing, those temporary boxes will be deleted. Now, those arguments are populated, which means they are assigned a value when we call the function. So let's go ahead and do this. I'm going to say, right, well, I'll just say red. 300 and 200 and let's start changing some of these values. I'm going to say green, yellow and just changing all of these values around so that it looks a little different. Okay, so now that we have this, what happens is we need to assign those values to the properties. So I'm just going to say, right, go grab the value that's stored in our color argument, width argument, and also height argument. So the first time this constructor function is run, the color argument will be populated with the string green. This is the first parameter. The second parameter goes to the second argument, which the width is 300 and the height is 200. And then what we do is we target this, which don't forget is the new object. And we are creating a color property. And that color properties value is gonna come from this temporary box. So whatever this temporary box stores, which on the first run, it's going to be green, it will simply return the value green. And the same goes for the width and the height. So now we're creating three unique Apple objects. So let's go ahead and hit refresh. And there we go. On each run, we created the same template. They all link to the same prototype object. However, the property values are different and that's how you create constructor functions.